thanks, Justin, for the introduction. Um, obviously, um, tech.eu, uh, we write about technology companies in Europe. Um, so I know that there's a lot of in innovation happening in Europe that most people are not necessarily aware of. Um, so I'm very happy to be joined by, by three of the most interesting and fast-growing companies uh, in the region. Um, so the panel is not super diverse when it comes to gender, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, but it is super diverse when it comes to geography. Um, so we have both uh, a company from Paris, London, and Berlin, and we're going to talk about uh, specific characteristics of the local ecosystems and how it helped those companies achieve fast growth there. Um, but before we do that, obviously, we need to know who we have on the panel here. So I'm going to let all of you um, introduce yourselves very briefly. Uh, who are you? What's your company? What do you do? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Robin. So, um, hi, everyone. So I'm Cedric Tissier. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Phoenix Cap. So we are the French uh, member of the team here. Um, we're in the fintech space. We've um, started operating in Southern 15, and the idea is to provide working capital financing to SMEs in a few clicks by um, an intensive use, I would say, of technology. Thank you. Roman? Hi, I'm Roman, one of the founders of uh, Lazara, based in Berlin, or coming from Berlin. We are um, one of the leading um, fast retail companies online, and what we basically try to solve is if you were about to found uh, one of the most successful offline uh, fast fashion retailers like H&M or the Initex Group online, how would you actually do that? And we've been trying to solve that over the last two and a half years um, with some success. Thank you. <laughs> Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Klein. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cano. Uh, we're a creative computing company. Uh, we make computers that you build and code yourself, like Lego. Um, they come as kits, uh, affordable, accessible. Uh, you build them with a simple step-by-step -step storybook. Uh, kids as young as six in 86 countries, kids as old as 81, have used Cano to make computers, speakers, servers, screens, apps, artworks, songs, devices, um, Bitcoin miners, and probably more things by the time I finish this sentence. And then just one word for the tech staff. Um, whoever David Fano is, that's not, that's not me. Um, so <laughs> if, if you wouldn't mind changing it, and if all of you wouldn't mind just tweeting, maybe at David Fano, but also at Team Fano, uh, T-E-A-M-K-A-N-O. <laughs> That David guy is not going to know what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why are all these people suddenly tweeting at me? Oh, computer kits, yeah. <laughs> so, well, thank you for introducing yourselves. Now we can get to the real discussion is on how to achieve fast growth in Europe, which I guess you can also call scaling up. It's a, it's a modern term. Um, but there, there are different aspects when it comes to growing. Um, gro growing fast might mean hiring fast or hiring a lot of people really fast. It might mean raising a lot of funding and spending it really fast. Uh, it might mean revenue growth. So we're going to talk about all of these aspects. Uh, we're going to start with the first one. Uh, maybe just tell us how many people are you now? Oh, we are a small team. We're 30 people. 30? So we're roughly 200. 200? 47. 47. OK. And when were you founded? Sorry? When were you founded? Uh, we founded the company uh, four years ago, but started operating in 2015. All right. So yeah. what do you con why do you consider yourself to be on this panel? What's the fast growth? Uh, the fast growth is since we started operating in 2015. Um, again, we're providing invoice financing companies to SMEs. Uh, in France, you have to imagine there are like 47 companies using invoice financing. In about 15 months of operation, we have about 4,000 companies right. using us. And this is in France? Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. So I mean, the growth is just massive. Awesome. Um, 200 people? I know started by name. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> and w when, uh, when were you founded? Um, we, we started actually, so we founded the company September 2013 and um, went live in November 2013 with our first ah, so sales of day. Yeah. Quite rapid growth yeah. in terms of people at least. When were you founded? Uh, we launched at the beginning of 2013, or rather, sorry, we were founded at the beginning of 2013. We launched uh, the computer kit on Kickstarter in November of 2013, and we shipped the first production run in September of 2014. All right. uh, yeah. Well, that immediately brings us to the next topic, which is the funding part. Um, obviously, you used Kickstarter, so that's crowdfunding. Um, why did you do it in the first place? I mean, it, you know, the... the I thought it was the perfect place for a misfit, uh, somewhat quirky project such as ours. I mean, you know, I'd never been in tech uh, or in business even. I was, a, I was a journalist reporting on technology and business for Newsweek. Um, oh, so there's hope for us journalists out there. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, um, despite the Peter Thiel allegations. Yes, today. I know. Um, but, um, 
I mean, the, the, the business came from a challenge from my six-year-old cousin um, playing around with the Raspberry Pi, this little green circuit board naked in 2013. He challenged us uh, to make it as simple and fun as Lego. Um, his father, Sol, Mika, my little cousin, so my, my big cousin, uh, gave us enough money to build the first 200 prototype kits. These were like hand-folded white boxes, bits and storybooks inside. Um, just on word of mouth, we sold those out. We workshopped them uh, all around the world, Israel, the United Kingdom, um, America, uh, South Africa, Sierra Leone. Um, and sort of the strength, I think, of the, the story in a sense, you know, build the first computer company based on creation rather than consumption. We, we thought this would be something that the crowd would like. So we, we you asked were right. for... Ah, we were right, yeah. Um, How much did you raise in total? We, we asked for $100,000. The premise at the time was to make 1,000 more prototype kits, which cost us $99 to make. Um, we set a 30-day funding goal to reach the $100,000. We ended up raising it in 13 hours. Uh, and 30 days later, we'd raise 1.5 million from backers in 86 countries, including uh, Steve Wozniak, who pre-ordered a kit. And I think cool. by going through that channel, we were able to make it a, a much broader, more democratic story. The crowd actually participated in the product design, right. from details as big as the, the shape of the case to the granularity of the copy. So that was one element for us. Cool. And you've since raised venture capital as well, right? Yes. Yeah. How much? Uh, we've raised 19 million total in venture capital. Cool. Yeah. Um, Roman, you've raised venture capital as well. Correct. How, how much have you raised so far? Um, so far, we've raised 22 million euros. Okay. Have you raised funding? Yes, we, uh, we raised about 15 million euros of equity and 20 million in debt. Got it. Okay. So then my obvious next question would be, if you want to grow fast in Europe, do you need to have funding in the first place? Because I know there's, there's relatively little um, companies that we can point to as examples of bootstrap companies, but there are some of them. But do you feel like you need to have that you know, those, those investors, uh, that capital involved to achieve the fast growth that you've had so far? Yeah. I mean, I think it's impossible to do the other way around. I mean, right. you know, uh, one of the, you know, reasons for, uh, for growing is basically because you can invest. Otherwise, you know, unless you are on the business that, you know, is such a generation of, you know, cash flow that you can invest without actually borrowing or getting equity investors, you just need, you know, huge amounts of money. These markets, you know, I mean, in mass states are very fragmented. So you need to invest in each country based on you, the needs and regulations and, you know, how you can actually, you know, get uh, the nice way of, you know, of acquisition of new clients. So it's, I, I would think it's compulsory. Yeah, so you, you literally couldn't have built this business without having invested I mean, in Yeah, I mean, basically to build my business, you have to imagine before actually you can actually finance a company, you already need to have 2 million euros in a bank account that is going to stay there for as long as you're going to operate. Got it. So yes, I mean, I was not that rich. Sure. Yeah, I Roman, think, same question. Yeah, um, I think for us, um, we saw it a bit different. Like all of the guys in our company are very impatient. So uh, how we really think about it is we could have built uh, also a great business um, by bootstrapping, but, um, um, but it took, would, would take like so much longer. And uh, how we think is we kind of raise money, which buys us the most important thing in life, time. So we would have probably needed 10 years without external funding to get where we are now after two and a half years. And um, that's how we actually think about it, yeah. All right, so you raised funding to accelerate the business. You already had the business going, but you just wanted to move faster, essentially. I yeah, absolutely, yeah. Makes sense, okay. Alex? I mean, we're a, we're a hardware business, so it's very difficult to get started without a little chunk of change. So, sure. I mean, we were very fortunate to, to get funding early on. Um, the, the other side to it was, um, Similarly, we really wanted to move fast. You know, we saw these phenomena converging, you know, low-cost computing, open source, the maker movement, and this new urge on the part of the younger generation to figure out how computing works. You know, you hear it as the learn-to-code phenomenon, but it's, it's even deeper than that. Um, and we knew that if you could position um, a, a new kind of end-to-end computing platform around these phenomena, you could grow really, really quickly. So we also raised money because we wanted to, we wanted to race, and uh, we think there's, there's a lot of good to be done through a project like this as well. Yeah, and I think to, to add to Alex, I think um, what, what really, you, you, can, you can do it without external uh, fundraising, but you always, there's the fear of missing out because someone else next to you, he might see that something's great and he would be just more aggressive, take more money on, and then you, you kind of five years later down the line, you're like, yeah, but I built a great business, uh, but, but there's, you know, 10 other companies who were more aggressive in fundraising who just won all of the market share. So unless you're like, like, like in a 
super crowded field where you have something that's 100% defendable, which I, th I, th I think, you know, more, too many people think that their business is defendable. Anything can be disrupted. So I, I would always suggest to, to do anything to accelerate your growth to get it to a position where, where you just, you know, have to win. Got it. Okay. So let's talk about your respective locations. Um, has Alex, has being in London helped? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I love London. And it, you should all <laughs> go there and go watch uh, English Premier League football and have steak pies. It's the world <laughs> city, I think. Um, for us, it was extraordinarily helpful. Um, in the founding moment, um, we were right near Cambridge. That was where I was doing my grad degree, and that was where the Raspberry Pi was invented in this True. kind of wave of low-cost computing. Uh, PCBs for less than the price of curling irons was really arising out of Cambridge. So it was good to be in the vicinity there. But then London, as well, has an amazing heritage of kind of industrial design. You know, Rolls-Royce, others. It's a, it's a place that values craft and applying craft to business. Um, I also think it's, uh, it's a community that was very much on the up as well, and still is when we were founded. You know, the government had just invested in Tech City, Silicon Roundabout. Um, you know, the, uh, in our early days, you know, Boris Johnson agreed uh, to race uh, Mike Bloomberg, the, mayor, the former mayor of New York City, building the computer. So we got a great bit of early press from that. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the culture was right for us. So it's been helpful. Yeah, love awesome. London. Um, Cedric, same question, but basically when you look at the, the fintech space in Europe, it's obviously booming everywhere. You can see interesting fintech companies popping up pretty much all over the place. But it seems to be that the center, and even globally, the center is kind of shifting towards London. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, yeah, London. When uh, are you uh, moving? Yeah. When are you moving? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not moving because, I mean, I would say it's the same question. I mean, being in France really has, you know, its advantages and its drawbacks. It is, you so know, tell its us drawbacks about is obviously, you know, you're not in London, which is one of the big hurdles that you need to overcome. Um, but still, uh, you know, uh, I was lucky enough. I was in fintech for many years. It's my second company in space. I sold my first company in 2014, so I knew the investors. Uh, and I, I really have that long vision in fintech. I know it's going to really get through hurdles we see now and hiccups, but that's part of any industry growing. Um, so um, that was, you know, to some extent a drawback because it was more difficult, but to some extent it's really an advantage because, um, I mean, France is really... I would say the most traditional country in terms of the financial services I have ever known. You know, it's 92% of the financing comes from the banks when you're in SME. You don't have any, you know, like innovation that you would see uh, in the UK, such as the digital banking, you know, Mondo, Atom Bank, Sterling. Nothing ever comes close in France. Um, so you really have that much of an opportunity if you're really, you know, willing to invest massively into the uh, evangelization of the alternative, you know, uh, making sure that people are aware that something else exists and some user experience is going to be better and you're going to have more transparent, more, you know, um, you know, better service out there. And for that, it's been a major, you know, um, major advantage because the, the, basically the field was empty. It was up to us to build a castle, basically. Fair enough. Um, let's talk about Berlin in a second. Uh, yeah. I know a lot gets said about Berlin, um, but obviously it's a great place to start a business these days, and it's been a great place for many, many years now. Um, but has it really helped you, the fact that you're yeah. in Berlin? Or so do you I think, think you could have built this company anywhere? No, I think, um, so I was actually studying in London before that, and I, I love the place. It, it, it's at the forefront of innovation when it comes to culture, fintech, machine learning, great front-end engineers. There's also very few days when you cannot wear actually a winter jacket, so that's kind of a bit challenging. <laughs> but um, um, I think for us, Berlin was just a very natural place because um, um, we wanted to be very international from the very beginning. So we're in 23 countries, and I think it attracts a lot of talent from a lot of different com um, countries, which is also the case in, in London, but you can actually afford to live there. Yeah? Sure. So I think. In, which is kind of important for the quality of life for people, and that's what keeps them also in, in the city. So um, I think you spend 25 or 30 percent of, of your of your income actually on rent in Berlin versus more than 50, 60 percent in London. So for us, it was a very natural space. And plus, now you have kind of this network of um, a lot of fast-growing retail companies, a lot of consumer internet. I would say that for consumer internet, that's the best place to 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 go if you want to internationalize because you have a lot of great talent. If, if you kind of want to bootstrap, we, I, was, I was yesterday actually at, at a talk with, with a few guys and I said, investors, and they said, you know, if, if I invest 10 million into a Silicon Valley company, um, that's good, but that kind of is the equivalent of 40 million in Berlin because you can actually spend, you know, everything's 25% of the price. Right. 
well, fits well with our model, eh? Let's stay on that, <laughs> let's stay on that topic. Um, talent and how expensive it is. And London obviously comes forward as the most expensive place in Europe uh, to build a business in terms of, you know, the, the cost of living is so high. Um, office space is so high. You know. So how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it is, it is a trade-off. And I mean, you have to, you have to be careful to bring in people who are willing in those early stages to work uh, for at least in the first year below market because they believe in the idea and you're giving them equity. Um, the advantage that London offers, I sound like a pitch person for the UK, <laughs> I'll get to the, to the drawbacks, but like the advantage is it's this central hub in many ways for a lot of the best talent in the European Union. Um, we have 47 people working for us. Um, they represent 20 different nationalities. So look, some of them are working in China, many are working in London, but I think the... Uh, the overall challenge is to create a culture that, that, that is so tight-knit where people come in and, and love, love what they do so much that you know, they're there for more than the money. And, and yeah, it costs a lot to go climbing on a climbing wall in London or to go out to dinner, but you know, sensible and smart people know how to make their best of an expensive city, I think. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's try to give some advice to the entrepreneurs in the room here. Um, I don't want to call it growth hacking, but are there any techniques that you think you've mastered that has helped you scale and grow the company faster than anyone else would? Um, I mean, mastered would be, uh, you know, like um, probably a big word, but I mean, our, our approach to really being able to, to grow fast because it, it was definitely, you know, the objective, we don't want to be like a small player, was finding a way to get the um, acquisition channel of new users different from what the traditional players actually do. Um, I mean, in our case, you know, the traditional players, if you want to get invoice financing in France, you basically apply to your bank that is going to send uh, your case to the uh, subsidiary in case of the invoice financing business, and you get into a four, six-week process where they get, you know, the audition process of whatever, you know, your accounting software, your uh, invoice process, collection process. Um, and we thought, you know, that's just ridiculous. You just need, when you need a financier, you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, you know, I need a financing. I basically would like to set it up from my, you know, laptop in front of my computer 24-7. So what we thought the good way to be was really plugging our financing onto the uh, systems that the companies are using, accounting software, invoicing platforms, collection software, so that you can, when you do your accounting, you know you're going you're gonna to have a work capital financing need. You can just you know, go select the invoices you want to send to us, and a click of a button, you get you know, financing. Sure. It's really transforming the invoice sorry, into cash. Yeah. And that has been massive in terms of conversion. So That's why fairly you know, simple on the face of it. It is, it is simple in the face. I mean, it's super complicated business. It's like everything that is simple, you know, from it's a client's like perspective, <laughs> you get the back end. Um, but at the end of the day, the proposal for the user expense was so massively different from what, you know, was uh, proposed by the usual players. We managed to get, you know, 10%, you know, market share in about a year, which is, you know, it's massive amazing. in a country. It's quite impressive. Massive. Roman, any tips and tricks? Yeah, I think this is probably the most easy thing that you've heard, but, you know, when, when we kind of reflected on what really makes us grow and also grow over the long term, it was really about getting the right talent into the company. Um, so, so what does that mean? I think one, one smart person from our board, actually we have a lot of smart persons on the board, but one <laughs> particularly smart person said, okay, you can only grow as fast as, as the talent that grows inside your organization. Because sometimes if you go too fast, um, then, then uh, you know, your talent doesn't have the time to, to, to grow with it. And once we realized how important that is, we also tried to professionalize all of our HR and recruiting efforts. We worked with smartness tests, you know, the things that you have to, to do that you actually uh, to, to get into Oxford. Right. We worked with, uh, you know, checklists for all the, for all the uh, hiring managers so that we, you standardized and, um, and professionalized the whole recruiting process and, and that has helped us a lot to a drive you know the, the fun, uh, people from from the top of the funnel, but make the funnel also better. Right. Um, and, and the way we think about it is it's, it's just uh, uh, you know also a conversion rate game. Like the the same met, the same um, techniques that we apply for measuring our online marketing, we try to apply for our recruiting funnel. Great advice, um, Alex. Same question, but a little bit more specific about crowdfunding campaign. Why do you think it was successful, and how do you think other uh, entrepreneurs? Uh, that are about to do crowdfunding can maximize their chances of having a successful campaign? Well, I guess I'll answer the question both, both about crowdfunding sure. and, and 
and building any new business. And I'll give, I'll give three habits, things that, that serve us well. The, the first is never ever lose sight of the product. Never ever forget about the experience. Never get so wrapped up in the meeting or, or the process that you forget that your reason for being is the product, the service, the experience. Use it yourself. Have an hour a week where everyone on the team uses it. This is what we should be doing now. I mean, the, that is so easy to forget in all the, the late nights and the big discussions and debates of starting a new business. Don't lose sight of the product. Um, number two is stay outward focused. It's, it's related. You know, bring, bring in real customers. Listen to them. Hear their voices. We have real kids come through the office every week. We're outside the building as much as we're inside. Stay outward focused. When you're small, you can be porous. You can be sensitive. You can respond and react to the culture and the zeitgeist. So, so stay outward focused. And then the th and this applies to crowdfunding as well. If it's just a, if, if you have in your head like, um, this is going to be a STEM toy that serves this market segment, the story will never be appealing. You know, you have to really listen to what's going on in the world and respond and create an experience that's genu genuinely new, new and you really care about. And then the, the third tip would be to like ignore all of the tips, right? Just because bi business is way, way too complicated to be boiled down to a, to sure. a set of like rules that everyone must follow. And it changes every day faster uh, now even than any other time in history. So um, resist the urge to look at the blog post of the seven habits of highly successful entrepreneurs. You know, ignore that. Just respond to the situation, focus on the product, listen, and, and stay in independent-minded. All right, guys, we're out of time. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully, it'll be one of you on stage tomorrow. I don't know. We shall uh, see. But if you do, uh, do a great job. Thank you.